Everyone wants to invest in the next blockbuster innovation breakthrough. The challenge, though, is how to distinguish the diamond from the dud. As a former Presidential Innovation Fellow under Barack Obama, an ex-employee of Facebook and Google, and the author of The Fuzzy and the Techie, Why the Liberal Arts Will Rule the Digital World, Scott Hartley certainly knows a fair few things about technology strategy. But as co-founder of Everywhere Ventures, which invests in startups, it's not the idea that determines whether he's backing a company. What Scott looks for is a storyteller. Everyone has the same words on the page. Everyone can sort of say, yeah, I had that idea too. But one person is able to execute it, one, one person is able to tell the story with the gravitas, to hire the team, to raise the money, to build the product, to, to scale the company, right? And so I think, you know, when I look at venture capital, I tend to think of these soft skills of psychology and storytelling um, much more than I do finance and, and business. The things that we're really looking for um, aren't so much traction at the early stage, mm. it's a uh, perspective on that person. It's a perspective on their authenticity, um, the grit, the perseverance. Um, some of the questions we ask are questions about adversity or questions about flexibility of mind. And so how do you kind of get at that? You know, one way that we find that we sort of are able to get at that sometimes is through the, ne the negotiation process that leads to closing a deal. And so through that negotiation process, whether it's valuation or it's a term in the term sheet, or it's the ask for pro rata rights to be able to invest in the future. These are all minor forms of confrontation of mm -hmm. investor versus entrepreneur. And we tend to think that how they problem solve in those critical moments, those little crucible moments, are in indications or litmus tests for how they might face adversity or face challenges in the future. Are they gonna be collaborative and communicative with us? Mm -hmm. Or are they gonna be adversarial and sort of run to lawyer? So it's a little snapshot it's into a sna how It's a behave. snapshot. And so really what we're looking for in founders is a lot of these soft skills, a lot of these human skills, these, um, and to your point of being spun a yarn, you know, storytelling is one side of the coin, authenticity is the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. Do I really believe that this person has the fortitude and the authenticity that they're gonna be able to build after this problem for the next five to 10 years, you know, as it typically takes to build a, a company of significance. So you're looking for innovators, people who can deliver. D does the sort of era of tech and really advanced tech now, and, and obviously everyone's talking about artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. does that um, infuse you and make you think, suddenly innovation potential has just expanded um, teamfold now? Absolutely. I think, you know, I think that we had this notion of the full stack developer a few years ago where you kind of uh, could, could basically know all the different levels of, of, of launching and deploying a, a product. Now it's more of the full stack integrator where mm -hmm. you've got the building blocks. The building blocks are becoming chunkier and bigger bits and it really takes a higher level critical thinker to be able to assemble those building blocks. And so I think the big irony of technology getting better is that our comparative advantage is to become more human, to be able to ask the bigger questions, to be able to assemble the building blocks in different ways. And so, of course, there will always be technologists on the frontier developing those new building blocks, but there's going to be 10 or 100 times more people that are able to assemble those building blocks to solve different problems around the world. You sound very reassured, very calm about the, the sort of future potential and the future role of, of the human in this mix. Does it surprise you there seems to be such a an anxiety, I guess, or a skepticism about the future of jobs, the future of work, the future of the human? You know, I think that th there's truth to both sides, right? And so the, the truth, I think, is that there are short-run dislocations, there are short-run shortfalls in uh, jobs or certain skill sets that, that do have big demand for them. Mm -hmm. I think where um, the, the broad media debate gets it wrong is in lumping jobs with, with tasks. When I think about any job, any job is made up of a hundred different tasks. And those hundred different tasks, some of which are highly routine and highly rote, some of which are very involved and cognitive, uh, collaborative, mm -hmm. where you need communication to grease the wheels and to share tasks across different skill sets. Um, and so when, when I look at AI and generative AI specifically, the way that we see the rubber hit the road is that it's, uh, it's an optimizing technology. So it's a technology that takes rote and routine tasks and miniaturizes them or makes them more automatable. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at a job and the holistic nature of a job, there's maybe 10, 20, 30% of that job that have highly routinized tasks that could go to machine learning 
if it's a cognitive task and it could go to robotics if it's a manual task. And we've sort of seen this evolution over many years and maybe it is getting faster, which maybe leads to some of those dislocations in the short run. But the long-term prognosis I think is deeply positive. And I tend to think of AI um, as sort of a debate of strong versus skinny. And the debate kind of comes down to on the same inputs, do you want to 10x your outputs or do you want to cut your inputs by 10 to generate the same output? Right. And I think in a very competitive environment, most companies optimize and, and opt for that s strong perspective of I'm going to take my same inputs and I'm going to multiply my output by 10 mm -hmm. or by 100. And of course, on the margin, some companies will have to choose skinny. Um, but I think the net net of it is that output goes up. Um, technology is a multiplier. And you know, then we have to worry about sort of inclusion, diversity, and other ways that we make sure that that um, doesn't just go to very thin companies run by 10 people that have undue power in, in the world. Well, but there's some way that um, we balance that generation of wealth, that generation of information. And so I think on some level, technology moves at the pace of technology, government moves at the pace of government, but at some point, government needs to have enough innovation internally, maybe through incentive structures or bringing in technologists to be able to build a regulatory environment that maybe can at least look eye to eye with technology. Mm -hmm. And I think it will always be a, a losing battle and you know, coming out from the side of, of innovation and you know, my, my role, I certainly think technology, technology should always lead government and not the other way around. But you don't um, want the gap to be getting bigger. But the and gap bigger. shouldn't be expanding at an exponential rate like it maybe is.